This is the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast, session number 212. David Snyder on Persuasion Power. Welcome to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast with Jason Lynette, your professional resource for hypnosis training and outstanding business success. Here's your host, Jason Lynette. Get ready to become even more influential and persuasive in your process. Hey, it's Jason Lynette here. Excited to have David Snyder back on the program now for the second time. Uh, David was previously on the program a number of years ago. And yes, to this day, I still swear this was only coincidence that he was previously episode number 69. But then again, here we are today, episode number 212, and this time a little bit more laser focused of a conversation, specifically talking about conversational hypnosis. And what I want you to really take away is one of the biggest points in this dialogue is how little we get into the concepts of use this word rather than that word, use this technique rather than that technique, and the sort of uh, needless naming of everything that's often kind of rich inside of these communities where, you know, so often people can point at the jargon and say, oh, that's what that technique is, but it comes down to can you really put it into use in the real world? Now, a few other resources inside of this conversation – we're going to link over to the video that David talks about, about rapid healing in nine minutes. You can simply head over to worksmarthypnosis.com to the show notes for this episode, and I'll just link directly over to that video. We'll also find some resources for you to check out as David talks about Amy Cootie's work in terms of power poses and what that entails. But really, as you really dive into this conversation, look at the ways that it comes back to state management. So many of these strategies always come back to self. What is that foundation? What is that grounding? And some interesting ways of looking at whether we call it deep trance identification or modeling, which you're going to hear one of those sort of uh, through lines, one of those theoretical points that's underneath a lot of David's work with a really cool reference in terms of where it came from, which helped me to discover that, yes, that's something that I was already doing too, yet his example, his models were much cooler than mine but it still at least worked for me. Uh, so some mindsets in terms of when you go into that communication, whether it's with a client, whether it's business, whether it's even your personal life, this stuff applies everywhere. To look at, again, bringing it back to self and how do you step into that heightened version of you? How do you become that much more influential, much more, let's call it enticing version of you that people are now drawn to? This is a conversation to really listen to, take some notes and immediately put the these things into action and to get even more like this check out the website davidsnyderdc.com because actually coming up this year 2019 in November in the autumn we're bringing David Snyder here to the east coast he doesn't often do events over here on this side of the country but uh, I'd asked with our recent event I had Bob Burns in the area a couple of weeks ago and asking the folks in attendance who do you want me to bring to town next and David Snyder was at the top of their list so this is the event that's called real world conversational hypnosis masterclass it's it's a three-day event. All the details, once again, over at davidsnyderdc.com. As soon as I announced it, we got a bunch of signups. The exact dates are over on that David Snyder DC website, but it's all about empowering your skills of personal influence and also, of course, yes, covert change. So it's happening at a hotel rather convenient to the Washington, D.C. area. And here's just a sampling of some of the things you can read about and you'll learn inside of this live three-day event. Six stages of persuasion you can use in any context. How to control your emotional state on demand. That's one of those big points we talk about in this conversation. How to use these seven unstoppable language patterns. And I'll share a bit of the greedy nuance of this, which is that, uh, and this is not just to pat myself on the back, but if you ever see me doing guest events in my local area, it usually comes down to one simple premise on top of polling my local audience and finding who do they want me to bring to town. Uh, quite simply, it's often those people who are usually training classes at conventions when I'm also training classes at conventions. So David and I are often teaching at HypnoThoughts at about the same time. So outside of like a one or two hour workshop, I haven't yet had the experience. So let's fly him from San Diego here to the D.C. area and uh, do the event here. Uh, other cool points, how to bind the thoughts and ideas of people so they choose exactly what you want, how to master embedded commands, how to instantly and automatically sync and link your mind and body with another human being. 
Some of this sounds a little too good to be true, but I've seen this stuff in action. I've used a lot of it myself, and I'm looking forward to seeing David's nuances on these specific strategies. So again, check out the details of that event at davidsnyderdc.com. And so here we go. Let's jump directly into this week's session. This is episode number 212, David Snyder on Persuasion Power. Um trying to think about when I realized that. I think it was I, – I realized it pretty early. Well, depends on how you define early. Uh, I think it was during my sleepwalker days. I think, I think it was really in that transition period when I was going from you know focusing on social applications uh, into therapeutic – and just kind of look at therapeutic applications and really focusing on what I, what I would call uh, socially programmed hypnotic triggers. Uh, and then it's when I really realized that people are always in freaking trance, no matter what. And and so it's not about putting somebody in trance. It's about harnessing the trance states they're already in and then redirecting and managing in those states. And and it really came about to just learning how to be comfortable uh, giving instructions and, and having a hypnotic intent or at least an influential intent right from the very beginning. Um, yeah. With it, yeah. So, There's a phrase you just used there, which I love, of socially programmed hypnotic triggers. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the most common ones are, are the ones that uh, Robert Cialdini in his book, Influence the Psychology of Persuasion, uh, talks about. But, but Hollywood has been programming us. Uh, books and literature have been installing what we should and shouldn't want and certain triggers and behaviors uh, that actually go against our basic uh, biological wiring. Uh, for for centuries, if not you know decades at the very least, centuries if you want to you know depending on how you want to slice it. Uh, and so, one of the biggest ones, that I, and I make a joke about it, but really it happened uh, during my social influence when I was really uh, cutting my teeth in the in the, in the attraction niches, uh, was when I decided to affect the uh, the voice and mannerisms of Captain Jack Sparrow in my regular daily life. Uh, and I lovingly call that phase Captain Jack the Acupuncturist, um, where I literally did a deep trance identification on uh, not just Captain Jack Sparrow, but a, a synthesis of very, very high level, uh, very popular classic romantic char- uh, hero characters, uh, including uh, James Bond, uh, Austin Powers, Captain Jack Sparrow, uh, Wesley from the, from the Princess Bride. And I, I created this this composite personality for myself, so to speak. And I stepped into that character, and I literally lived it for months. Um, and and I just watched the effect that that stepping into this persona and and living living life this way with this adventurous attitude energy about me changed the behaviors of everyone around me. Uh, and that's when I realized that it's all about it's all about I know on a on a biological level it's all about mirror neurons and proprioception uh, but on a on a on a much more subtle level it's all about the frame you hold and the frame you portray and because the person who holds the frames longest and the strongest wins. What I love about that as a story, just for a bit of a through line, is that in my stage hypnosis days, which is where I started, I probably did the same thing, except my source of inspiration was Harold Hill in The Music Man, you know, because we got trouble in River City, uh, which your your examples are much cooler than mine. Uh, <laughs> but going to that place, which for people who know that musical, here's the guy who whatever he decides he's going to do, he finds a way to figure out. You know, so to be on stage with these volunteers and just decide, oh, here's something we can do for this. And it just got me to the right place. And the influence kind of came naturally that it wasn't any more thinking about just the individual techniques and words and the phrasing. It was that the character was becoming the influential part, too. Absolutely. And it's the care. And this is a big this is a big part of the influence that I teach both therapeutically um, like in my our identity by design program, as well as what I teach in my killer influence and advanced social and vibrational influence classes, it's the personas we take on that empower us or weaken us. And at any given moment, we have a choice as to what identity or what uh, personality suit we want to step into. And depending on which ones we choose and how deeply we commit to being in that character, in that that persona, 
will have access to skills and abilities that some people would consider magical uh, in, in many cases, or, or at the very least, super charismatic. Yeah. So let's put that into a change context. I'm curious, is there a story that comes to mind of noticing a very different interaction by doing that? Well, yeah. Well, going back to you know, using the Captain Jack, the acupuncturist, uh, you know, days, um, what we found out is that, you know, and this is actually goes back to a book, uh, which you may want for your, your people called Red Gold. And it's, uh, if you remember when back in the seventies, which might be a little, a little bit before your time, you're a, you're a youngster after all, um, uh, back in the seventies when the Soviet, Soviet athletes swept the, uh, the summer and winter Olympics, they, they, they took like 70 gold medals. Well, what most people didn't realize was there was a very powerful system of autogenic training and sports psychology that was being used on these Soviet athletes. Um, and uh, that uh, the author of the book, Red Gold, Grigory Ryport, was one of the scientists uh, behind that program or involved in that program. And what the Russians dis- discovered, or I should say the Soviets, not the Russians, uh, was that each human being was not one person, that each human being had these subroutines running in them. They called them co-personalities. And that by stepping in and out of these co-personalities, uh, some of them obviously corresponded to what we would consider the Jungian archetypes or, or, or what have you. But a lot of them, you could have a gluttonous archetype right next to your warrior archetype or a, a, a lying archetype right next to – or a lying co-personality rather, right next to your mother or co-personality. And so what the, what the Soviets discovered was that these personas, these co-personalities had a level of dominance in a person's life based on the amount of energy that was given to it by the subconscious mind. And they taught their athletes specifically how to go into a metaphorical construct and literally pull the plug to the energy feeding those, those, those co-personalities and redirect it into uh, the more positive uh, co-personalities that they wanted to have more dominance and be more prevalent in their system. Um, and that's actually became a big part of what we do in our Identity by Design program. Um, but in terms of, of stepping in, you see, you see variations and versions of this ability that we have. Uh, you see it in NLP, in their, in their exercise. And a lot of times people, people see the surface of the technique, but they don't grasp the ramifications of it. Uh, if, you're talking, if you look at things like gestalt therapy or you look at things like NLP's uh, perceptual positions or the technique that's der- derived from that called new behavior generator – when you step into a perspective, like uh, if, if to use a, just to, to use uh, perceptual positions uh, from NLP, that's one of, or parts therapy. Uh, these are all different aspects of the same phenomenon. Um, but if you if you step into one perspective, let's say you're having an argument with somebody, you step into their perspective where you're arguing with that person, then you literally spatially change yourself so that you're looking through the eyes of the person you're arguing with, and you see things from their perspective, and you argue back. You're going to get a completely different perspective of the argument. Whereas if you take a meta position where you're looking at – where you're sitting like off to the side watching yourself argue with this person, watching this person argue with you, you have a completely different experience of that interaction. These are aspects of this identity phenomenon, this personality phenomenon. There's a spatial component to everything that the nervous system does that is part of the coding system that the, the – the, the human being that is that, that the nervous system or the neurology uses to create your experience. So when you create a persona, there's a holographic. It's pregnant with a lot of information that is presupposed in there that you have access to, but you don't know you have access to until you step into that persona. Just as a simple way to to hack this, um, and actually this was actually discovered by one of my associates, TJ. When we were teaching people hypnotic language, we discovered that if they actually practice some of the drills using a for, an accent. Or taking on the person, like say you took on the, the, the twang of a, a Baptist faith healer or a pirate or something like that, you would actually learn the shit faster. It would actually just it would it would change how you did, and that's actually what happened when I started uh, putting taking on these uh, this uh, Captain Jack persona, so to speak. Was I started the my my mannerisms changed, uh, the way I spoke changed, uh, not just in terms of the accent, but in terms of of how I constructed my sentences. It was very, very strange. And it, and it, and it changed the way I look. When you, when you do this with people, there's a video on my YouTube channel. I think it's Speed Healing, How to Heal Emotional Pain in uh, 
I think it's nine minutes or less, where I take a young lady and I literally walk her into her garden where all these co-personalities live. I have her step into them and, and pull the plugs on all of them and then amplify that the persona she wants to have more power. And then I have her put them on. I have her step into them like kind of like Tony Stark steps into his Iron Man suit, right? And then, and then just like Tony Stark stepped into his Iron Man suit, he could take that Iron Man suit, step into his Hulkbuster suit, right? And become even more. So literally what I had her do was she stepped into one, then she stepped into another, and she stepped into another. By the time she was done, she was a completely different person. So much so that she actually went out and changed her name twice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a correlation to that, I, I had the years working in professional theater before getting mm -hmm. into uh, I'm a hypnosis. Too. Yeah, okay. So the, the number of times that the actor would not find the character until they saw themselves in the dressing room, in the mirror, wearing the actual costume. You know, even, and even down to the extreme specifics of the, the set, the costume designers who would actually build the underwear that people would have had in the 1500s, because that's what they'd be wearing rather than here's your uh, pink thong, um, you know, to, to have that experience of everything from the ground up, then they find the character. I'm even flashing to, of course, when I say pop culture, I have to go to Michael Palin and Monty Python, you know, insisting that most of his characters have a mustache because he didn't. Because that helped him to get into it even better, which, by the way, there's the key to, to becoming more influential. But I love that so much of this, as much as the dialogue can be focused on influencing others, so much of it instead comes back to self, of controlling our own emotional state, controlling our own state management, and going to that sort of heightened version of us. And if we have to borrow that from somewhere else, how that actually enhances us as a result. Well, it all, at the end of the day, Jason, it always comes back to self. It always comes back to self. The science is there. We are literally, every moment of every day, literally programming people how to treat us, how to think about us, how to, how to catalog and position us in their minds. The, the studies by the University of Minnesota demonstrated that, that uh, if, I, if I took a man and a woman and I put them in a conversation, they were completely blind and I gave the man an arbitrary picture and an arbitrary CV, depending on on the, uh, you know, the, the, the attractiveness of the person in the picture. And by the way, the person in the picture was not the person they were talking to. Uh, they, would, they would rate that person you know, more intelligent, more charismatic, more socially adept, more skillful, more funny, blah, blah, blah. Now, that's almost not intu that's almost intuitive. We almost realize that, but that's not the importance of that, this particular study. What they did with this study was, and what they discovered was, first, when the man felt that he was, uh, and this went, for, it went both ways for both genders. Uh, when the man felt that he was talking to someone attractive, he always rated her highly, more socially adept, more skilled, uh, more competent, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we get that. When the, the woman receiving the communication re, uh, reported how she felt about the conversation, she felt like the man on the other end of the phone saw her, understood her, got her completely, and really just uh, vibed, so to speak. Okay. Now, that's almost intuitive, too. The difference happens is when you flip it. When the man thought he was talking to a woman who, as George Carlin used to say, had a severe appearance deficit, um, you know, he, he almost always rated her less socially adept, more uh, less competent, less uh, interesting in any way. The woman, uh, when, when asked about she, how she felt about that conversation, almost always reported that uh, he felt like the, they just didn't gel, like, there, like he really didn't get her, like there the conversation just didn't, didn't flow, things like that. That's not even the most interesting part because what they did with these conversations – now remember, this is all blind. Everything is artificial. There's the, the pictures are not the person they're talking to. The CVs are not representative of the other person. It's all – it's everything is blind. They, they took the recordings – of this conversations and they, they edited them like severely edited them like aggressively to all you had was just the woman's responses to everything the man said, just the woman's responses to everything the man said. They took those recordings and they played them for a group of independent analysts and the analysts were asked to rate the woman based solely on her responses to the man. I, I can't remember the exact number, but it was in the high 90 percent. 
The analysts judged the woman exactly the way the man with the picture in the CV did, based solely on the quality of her verbal responses. That's how, yeah. So really driving home the meaning of the communication is the response that it gets, that here was this perception and that transcending through the dialogue. That's amazing. Yeah. If you think about the ramifications of that, how we think about people programs them to how we're going to be, how, how, how to respond to us in, in, in more ways than, than you can even think. There's something going on that's, that's below the threshold of conscious awareness. There's a communication that's inherent here. And maybe it's a, maybe it's an, an infrasonic frequency. I don't know. But when you take just the woman's responses and you play them for people who have, don't have a picture that I know of, have no CV, and then they're asked to independently rate this woman and it matches the evaluation of the person on the other end of the conversation. Something is going on here that, that I, I believe is, is probably mediated by our proprioceptive and mirror neuron systems. I don't know exactly how it works, but that's my working theory, and it seems to play out in practice and application. So as we take that, let's put that into application then. Does it start with the state management? Does it start with what we can brand as? And, and when I talk rapport, I'm not talking about that you and I like each other. It's instead that we can communicate and move the dialogue further because that doesn't always mean that we like each other. Where, where does that begin to put that in motion? It start, always starts with state control. Yeah. State, but, but an aspect of state control, one of the more advanced and subtle aspects of state control is frame control. Mm -hmm. How you establish meaning of an interaction. If you come into an interaction with the idea that the person you're about to interact with is the most interesting, fascinating, uh, curious person that you've ever met, then you will literally prime that person to be that person. And they'll, they'll respond and behave accordingly. In many ways to look at how we connect with our clients. Um, you know, one of my rants is that here's people who go, oh, they come in with their problems or they come in and they've, uh, you know, secondary gain, which is a thing at times, but probably not as widespread as some would suggest. If I'm working from the mindset that this person is motivated and they're going to follow all the instructions and be ready to go, um, that's every client that I get. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You're literally going to – this is why I stopped doing the classic hypnosis pre-talk. Yeah. Because – because my belief and, and my results so far clinically have kind of borne this out, that a lot of the things we're taught to teach a client during the pre-talk actually prime people to be that way. Yes. Well, I mean the, the phrasing of, well, you're not going to resist the suggestions because that's not why you're here. If that's not why they're there, why are we even bringing that up? Exactly. Yeah. 80, 80 90% of the time in my, in my – uh, Intakes, I don't even mention the word hypnosis, NLP, HMR, or anything. They Because the truth of the matter is, Jason, and you can you can verify this from real work, the truth of the matter is your clients don't freaking care. Oh, yeah. Well, they and all, well, if they did care, they're already past that because they've already agreed to come yeah. to your office and pay for the service. I tell my students <laughs> and I tell my clients that, you know what, your clients don't care if you waved a dead chicken over their head and staying the star sat bangled back, banner backwards as long as they got out of that chair better than they got in. You know, and, and that's what it comes down to. So in my intake, which my con I, I, everybody I, I work with gets a free 30 minute consultation and that consultation is designed for me to evaluate their suitableness as a client. I'm not there to sell them my services. They're to sell. They're there to sell me on. Are you good enough to be my client? <laughs> you know, and, and it's and, and that frame reversal that just that one change of frame generates massive compliance and, and ultimately massive compliance always leads to better outcomes. Right. And it switches that dynamic because again, it's no longer, it, it's almost getting into the takeaway sale that they're looking to sell you on that service, which I made that transition years ago as well. And suddenly now it's the easy to increase the rates, easy to get greater compliance and people are getting better results. Absolutely. Yeah. When we bring people in, our, our job is to see, is to actually give them an experience of, of change without ever using the word hypnosis. And so, you know, when we bring them in, uh, you know, there's a, there's a blurb that we use that seems to work really, really well. And, I, and I'll, I'll put it out. I'll, I'll, I'll speak it here. I don't know if you, guys, if you guys do transcript or not. But this is exactly what I say to every single client who reaches out to me. We offer all prospective clients a free 30-minute consultation to determine if your case is a fit for our methods. 
after you pass our screening, we'll discuss strategies and tactics for helping you get your case, your, your, your case resolved in the shortest amount of time possible. When you're ready to schedule your free 30-minute consultation, give our office a call at 858-481-1438. Uh, and so right, right from the get-go, we just put that out there that, that you know, we're, just because you call us doesn't mean we're going to accept you. Uh, and if, if what we have is, in, and, we don't usually, and when I do in live events, what I usually add on to that is if you're a fit, we'll tell you. If you're not a fit, we'll tell you that too. And we'll recommend other resources that you might try that might be a better fit for you. And that, that actually puts a lot of people at ease uh, when they come in. But when they come in, we don't, we don't you know, I do, I do a, a classic, one of the first things we do is a classic heavy hand, light hand balloon and book, whatever, whatever metaphor you want to use. That's as much of the old school hypnosis stuff as we do. Um, and I tell them they're not tests you can pass or fail, although I took a personality test once and I failed that. Uh, I get them laughing as much through the consultation as possible uh, because as they do that, they relax more, they become more responsive. Oh, that's, and that's what it comes down to. Uh, it's not about belief. That's what I was going to say. I tell my students, your job as a therapist is not to get your clients to believe you. Your client, your, your job is to get the clients to do what you say, to follow. Your job is compliance because none of the good you know, none of your years of training takes effect until the client actually follows your instructions and does what you tell them to do. And if you take that to its ultimate conclusion, if you have absolute compliance from a, t from a, from a client and you tell them to believe something, what's the outcome? I mean, to bring it back to conditioning and I mean, something that I kind of landed on years ago of compliance precedes suggestibility. I need you following a set of instructions before this is going to lead to anything, even inside of Reality is Plastic by Anthony Jackman. He just simply says, know the difference between instructions versus suggestions that we have to start with one. But you're right in terms of if we're going to use the word conditioning, we're conditioning a response to then eventually get to the place where we can now land whatever technique, whatever suggestion. And that's what gets it in motion. Absolutely. And I like, I actually like the tweak that, uh, that Mike, Man I heard Mike Mandel use once um, about direction, you know, giving direction instead of suggestion. And uh, I find that that's actually very, very useful. Uh, when we start directing people, even permissively, uh, we start upping our compliance dramatically. We start thinking of the suggestions we're delivering as direction rather than suggestion. It actually, in our minds, cements the power, makes what we're saying more certain and therefore more likely to be carried out by a person's nervous system. I'm curious, does that change in a conversational aspect? It can, but on an intention level, no. When we start making vivid descriptions with an intention for installation, that directiveness goes a little bit more stealth, but it's still there. There's an intention for direction or installation. And that's what, and when we start to, and we'll talk about this in the, in the, uh, the, the masterclass that we're doing out in uh, Washington, we'll talk about the difference between uh, explanation and installation. Uh, and we'll, we'll actually do a couple of drills so people can feel the difference because you, you can, you can prime people on one level to, by just telling a story, but when you have an intention to install something that takes it to a different, a different level. And, and many times, that's what a lot of these high-level, uh, multi-million-dollar speakers, like guys like Harvecker or Lisa, I don't know if I don't know if Lisa really does it that much, but uh, I know I know for sure Ecker does it, and Tony Robbins obviously does these things, these powerful story-based installations. And there's a feeling that you get when somebody uses an intent to install on you versus just telling a story. And what, and that's one of the things that that in uh, like in, in in August I'm going to be doing. Uh, a three-day killer influence defense against the dark arts training, which is actually how to do killer hypnosis, but also how to protect yourself from it. And one of the things that we'll be teaching people is how to, how to sense that difference between uh, just a basic description and a deliberate installation. Uh, it's, a, it's a body feeling that you get. And that's actually go, you know, kind of closing the loop on state control, going back to that. Frame control, which as I said was a, a more subtle aspect of state control, is a feeling-based phenomenon. It's based on the body feelings that you have. 
If you have a subordinate feeling in your body, you're going to act subordinate in spite of your best efforts. You're going to be largely incongruent if you try to act dominant with a subordinate feeling in your body and vice versa. So if we can learn how to control our feeling states through our physiology and our breathing, which is the foundation of what we're going to be learning in, uh, in November, because everything we do, even though we, are, we have one of the most powerful and effective conversational systems on the planet, one of the reasons is, is because it's empowered by your body states. And once you know how to do this both on a, on a physiological level as well as a cognitive level, then you get a synergy and a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts that fuels and powers your language and makes you extremely, extremely influential and charismatic in pretty much any context. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, the person that controls their state wins. What I love about that is, again, going back to state that, you know, we're a community at times that is looking for things almost as if like a magic trick that here's here's the technique, here's the principle, here's the way that I can phrase this embedded command differently and maybe that'll make it better. But instead comes back to what's underneath it, what's the frame, or just as important, what's the frame that we're setting before the frame, uh, you know, to reference Cialdini's other book, Presuasion, that if we can, this is something I've been doing for a while too, that if I can embed the sales process before I ever go for the sale, Absolutely. that thing is already done, as opposed to now I've reached this pivot point and now here's what it is and how much. Absolutely. And that can drop that actually, sales process inside. Yeah, and it's actually at that pivot point where most people lose it because they right, lose yeah. their identity. They can deliver, they can get up there and because they're so passionate about what they do, they can deliver this amazing content and then they get the, to the point where they have to ask the people to take the next step and they become somebody else. And everything, they, their energy, I've seen it happen with A-list copywriters. I've seen John Carlton literally become a wuss on stage when he went, when he transitioned from his talk to his offer. I never forgot that. Gary Halbert, I saw the same freaking thing. When he, when he was speaking at Frank Kern's uh, Underachiever Method, that's what it was. And the same thing. This is one of the, you know, two of the greatest copywriters of all time who can put these beautiful offers on page. And when they got up on stage to actually talk to a human being, they became the other guy. You know, and that's really what it comes down to. And you're right about state control being what everything can – here's the problem with our industry is that everybody talks about state control, but nobody gives you a methodology for training state control. And that's what I spent a good part of my life learning and, and, and kind of deciphering on how to do that. And that's why it comes back down to two, two aspects, physiology and volition. Most people try to utilize their willpower or their volition to modulate their emotional states. Well, that's like trying to put out a five alarm blaze with a squirt gun. All right? it, it doesn't work. The, the studies are there. Uh, unless you are an elite athlete, a, a special forces person, or a highly trained uh, yogi of some kind, the environment will overwhelm your neurology. It, it will cause so much arousal that your critical faculty will check out. And the other thing we need to understand about that aspect of it is that all emotional states are trance states. Every emotional state that you're in changes your reality. It changes your perceptual filters. And so once you understand that aspect of it, if you can prime a person's neurology to go into a, a what I would call what I call a predicate state, a state where they're already predisposed to viewing and processing your message in the way that's most useful for your outcome, uh, then you don't have to work all that hard. Just give them just the right information. They'll process it the way you that you're most likely going to lead to the outcome and they'll do what you want their way. And that all goes back to state control because when you understand physiological state control and you understand the mirror neuron system and you understand how your proprioception kind of works with all that stuff, you can prime somebody from across the room or right in front of them how to feel and, and, and give their body, their body state, the nudge it needs to process your information exactly the way you want. And they'll think it was their idea. And, it's, it, and this is something that has been, been shown not just in the hypnotherapy world. In fact, it's been, this has been utilized in some of the most harshest uh, persuasion environments on the planet and not just the LA singles bar, uh, but actually in the courtroom. Uh, you know, I've got about 30, 32 personal injury attorneys I th I've, I've worked with on, on everything from jury selection to dealing with expert witnesses and things like that. And I've literally seen the, that state control is the Jedi mind trick. I've literally seen 
you know, expert. I have videos. I, I have. I don't have the videos. My client has them. I'm not allowed to have them. Uh, but I have videos of my client uh, in, uh, deposing an expert witness, and the expert witness is actually waiving their attorney-client privilege to answer my my client's questions because he liked him so much. Beautiful. <laughs> it's it's just crazy what you can do. And there's no. T- and the best part about it is there's no top level to this. I haven't found one yet. This shit just keeps getting stronger. Well, what's cool about that moment, even though that may not be, let's say, in the wheelhouse of something that most people in our communities would need, you know, here's that place where let's take the same story, but change it over to the metaphor of here's the client who's been standing in the way of their own success, coming up with every reason they can't do it. And to do that and, you know, for their benefit, yes, there's going to be some linking to the change to themselves, but also to us as the practitioner. So that next series of directions can now lead to the next step. And really just, you know, demolish whatever structure that issue used to have. You mentioned earlier that it's not just volition, but also the, the physiology. Um, share some thoughts on that, please. Uh, well, well, the studies are there. Oh, I mean, obviously the most recent stuff that, and I, that, that I've been quoting a lot have been the, uh, the studies by Amy Cuddy on power poses. Um, that she, she, she went and invested. I, I don't have patience for that kind of research. I just read the results and I'll extrapolate from there. But I've been teaching we, – we've been teaching more advanced asked applications of that since 2005. But she did the science and that's, that's where I would tell most people to start. But to, to just paraphrase some of Amy's research uh, and to, to address some of the uh, inconsistencies actually that some people have found. Um, what Amy discovered was that when you – had a person hold uh, a, a certain type of pose, like the victory pose, which even blind children seem to know. They've never seen it, but yet when they when they score a victory in their life, they've, they've, they've won a game or something, their hands shoot up. So these postures are archetypal within our neurology. If you hold those postures for uh, at least two minutes, your whole state will begin to change so much so that it actually affects a change in the hormone release in your body. People who hold these victory poses and uh, I think one was called the Superman pose where you have your hands on your hips. Uh, One was called the chairman of the board pose. Uh, If people held these postures for as little as two minutes uh, based on blood work, not only would they get a corresponding state change, their blood would – they would get about a 20% boost in their testosterone and a corresponding drop in their cortisol level. So not only did they become more assertive, more willing to take risks – more authoritative and more confident, they became more relaxed. So what, what Amy took it a step further, she, she had people hold – she did a, a, a blind – a double blind – I think it was a double blind study. She had a control group. She had people who uh, did not do these power poses and they had people who did these poses. And they sent, she sent them into these mock job interviews. And these interviewers were trained to be the most non, just non-expressive, uh, uh, hardcore – interviewers possibly. They were trained to give absolutely no verbal or visual feedback. They were trained to ask the tough, really tough uh, in, uh, personal questions that were designed to just put these people in as much of a defensive state as possible. And then after each of these uh, these sessions, uh, the interviewers rated the people on, on how they did. Consistently, the people who went into that interview after doing a power pose scored higher than the people who did not, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, but what's interesting is, is that you know, and, and you'll and you, your people will, the, the people who come to the training in November, they'll experience this directly because we'll put you through a series of poses, and we'll ask you to summon up all of your willpower and try and, and do your best to go into an, uh, uh, the opposite state. And what we see over and over and over again, if I put you in a state of victory, and I have you hold that posture. And, and the breathing that you had in that state of victory and then have you as an act of will without changing your posture, without changing your breathing, keeping everything about your physicality the same, try to feel bad. They can't do it. And the minute they try, their posture wants to shift. And as long as they have enough cognitive resources to keep their body in the right posture, they will stay in the positive state. Now, that's huge for our Arvindus because most of us have shitty posture. If you look at the, if you, you know, just as an aside, look at what's the what's the, the physiology of somebody who's depressed? Yeah, they're slumped over. There's a lack of eye contact, and you know we can we can build the assumption, we can build the stereotype. Yet here's what that posture becomes. 
Yeah. If you want to see how fast they shift out of it, make them stand up straight like a soldier. Within two minutes, they won't be depressed anymore. They may be pissed, but they won't be depressed. <laughs> Here's the other corollary to this, and, and this is a kind of a squirrel, but you know, squirrel chasing. But as an aside, true or false? Depression is one of the most prevalent problems facing Americans today. I'd say true. Okay. Have you ever looked at the posture of somebody on a cell phone? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's, here's, here's the interesting corollary. When you hold a cell phone in your hand, your body gives you this huge pleasure rush. I think it's dopamine that gives you – and it kind of counteracts the, the, the effect of that posture. But what happens when you put the cell phone down? All of a sudden, you start jonesing, right? So you have this pleasure – depression cycle. The physiology of holding that phone puts you in a depressive state, but the dopamine rush from the cell phone makes you feel good. The minute you put the cell phone down, you start feeling anxious. So to look at that, I'm, I'm running that through the filters of the research that was done recently that people smoking, the biggest rush is right before they light up, which look at that posture that it's coming right up. I'm laughing because, uh, when, I, when I'm doing videos, there's a very specific, you know, anchored sequence that I run uh, right before the video takes off, which if you've seen the TV show Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I've heard of it. I haven't okay. had a chance yeah. to watch it yet. There's, um, you know, it's this posture, almost that superhero pose. There's a clap and the chest is out. And I'm watching this TV show of this uh, 1950s comedian. And of course, in that context, their anchor is the phrase, all right, tits up. It's like, well, <laughs> it's like, well, there you go. that's working. <laughs> and it was. And we all have – all of the, all, all the top performers I've ever, I've ever observed have something that they do. They have some physiological ritual, some physiological trigger that they engage. Or maybe it's not a physiological trigger. It's a psychological or a, a, a turn of phrase. But the minute they, they flip that trigger, their physiology shifts. And when the physiology shifts, the state engages. And this is the big thing because we're taught in this country that our mind controls our body. That's true enough to be true, but only if you're trained. The vast majority of people out there are not. They're at effect to their physiology. And if you don't understand that feedback loop, you're going to be running west looking for a sunrise because the minute the environment triggers a specific level of emotional arousal, that critical faculty is going to get overwhelmed. You're going to check out. But if you understand – physiology, you can always, unless you're tied up, <laughs> you can always change your physiology and get control back. That's the, the secret to this is functionally your physiology controls your psychology. If someone's in a, in a panic state, a few state, they're, they're losing their, their, their cookies. If I can get their physiology upright, solid, it will, it will interrupt that pattern and allow them the ability to access their cognitive resources so they can actually affect change on a cognitive level. But if I can't, if I can't access those, if they can't access those cognitive resources, they can't do anything you tell them to do. So, uh, you know, one time I had, you know, I had a kid come in, his mom, I don't know why his mom brought him to me. He was uh, recovering from, from uh, heroin. He was a, a, a conic user and he, she had, she had come to one of my meetups and thought I could help her son. And I brought, I brought him in and I did a couple of sessions with him. And he really, really got some good results from that. And then he went off and did his own thing. And then one day I get this phone call from his mom who's just freaking out. She, he's curled up in a fetal position. He doesn't want to go through withdrawal. He uh, doesn't want to go see his psychologist. Can I help? And I'm like, fuck. What do I <laughs> Pardon my French. But you know, I'm like, okay, uh, bring him in. So she brought him in and the guy walked in. He was a little, he's quite a bit taller than me, actually. He come in and he, he, he was literally bent in half. Yeah, that's how depressed and, and in his state this guy was. And, and he, literally, I, I knew right away that talking to him was going to be pointless because every psychologist on the planet had already told him, you should feel good. It shouldn't be this bad and blah, blah, blah. So I just, I just attacked his physiology. I literally walked up to him, put my hand in the small of his back, put my hand on his shoulders and just uh, popped his, his spine straight. <laughs> the Gumby. So changed. he was like, till he, yeah, literally, like, till he was yeah. like upright like a soldier. And in sec, he, he actually wasn't even a sec. He burst out laughing. Just, just the posture shift trashed the state. You know, when I was in, uh, and we were able to do some good stuff with him. 
you know, when I was back in acupuncture school, most people know I'm an, a licensed acupuncturist. Uh, I had a client come in. This is again back during my Captain Jack the acupuncturist phase, and I, where I was experimenting with all this stuff. Because when you're when you're an intern in medical school, um, you're basically bulletproof because they expect you to fuck up. They expect you to <laughs> they expect you to make mistakes. So I figured, well, if I'm going to work with hypnosis and acupuncture, maybe this is a good place to do it. So one day I'm coming into the clinic, and uh, I'm, I'm I'm approaching one of the treatment rooms. As I open the as I go as I'm approaching the treatment room, the door opens, and one of my fellow interns comes out. And they look at me and they've got this look on their face like, oh, I'm glad it's you. Uh, and I'm like, oh, what are you giving me now? And he, they hand me the chart. I, don't, I can't remember to this day if it was a man or a woman, but I know they had this look on their face like, oh, I don't, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you're dealing with this and not me. I walk in and there's this young man. He's about uh, early 30s, maybe late 20s, early 30s. He's just like the guy with the heroin addiction, literally slumped over. But this guy was deep in, in depression, deep in grief. And as I'm doing the intake, uh, come, it, I find out that um, A, uh, his partner, he was a homosexual, his partner had just died of AIDS and he had just been diagnosed with HIV. And so here I am looking at this guy and I know enough about the nocebo and the placebo effects and everything else to know that I had to change this guy's state. I, if, if the acupuncture was going to make a dent... I was going to have to uh, do some rather unusual things. So the first thing I did, because I, I've been practicing these physiological state control drills that we'll be sharing in November, I literally assumed his posture. I had to go, I had to go into it with him. I had to connect with him at his most deepest level of grief. And I kept going and I kept going and I kept going until I felt it, until I felt that click that let me know, and you'll understand this when you do the training. Let me know I had physiological rapport with him. Now, one of the things I do when I work with clients is, uh, and this goes back to kind of why we're talking today, is uh, you know utilizing conversational hypnosis before the actual hypnosis starts. Uh, well, there was never any overt hypnosis in my internship days. I was all covert or conversational. So once I had his state, once I, once I knew I had him, I kept talking. I used a, a variation of what we call the echo technique now, and then I slowly increment by increment, by increment, I began to change my physiology, just thin slices, until I finally had him sitting upright. And as he, as I did that, his state started to change. It started to lighten. He started to, he, I wouldn't say he got happy, but he, 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 he got a lot less hurt. He hurt a lot less, is I guess the best way to say it. From that point on, I knew I could reach it. I knew I had, I had an ac access to his unconscious both on a, on a cognitive level, a physiological level, and an emotional level. And so I put him on the table. And one of the things I did in acupuncture school was um, I would use conversational hypnosis techniques during the intake. And then when it came time, I don't know if you've ever had an acupuncture session, but you'd lay them on the table. Um, usually they have a gown on, usually under a heat lamp. And you go and you, you put the needles in the points. And after the, the, the needles are in the points, you have to leave them sit under the, or sleep under the heat lamp or anywhere, depending on the system of acupuncture, 20, 40, 60 minutes. Uh, 60 minutes is kind of long, but every now and then it happens. So what I would do is as I was needling the points, and one of the interesting things about, about this comes from a book by Felix Mann on acupuncture is that I learned this a long time ago, was that when you needle an acupuncture point, the brain automatically dips into an alpha state anyway. So they're already hypnagogic. Uh, so I'd had a, I had deep rapport. He was going to go. I knew he was going to go into a hypnagogic state anyway. So what I did was, as I needled each point, I used, I described what each point did using hypnotic language. And so I went around the entire table, describing each point using the seven language patterns and others that we'll be learning in November. And then when he when he was all primed, I had him close his eyes, and I said, "Now I'm going to teach you a very special." ancient Chinese meditation technique. I want you to close your eyes and relax the tiny muscles in your eyelids to the point where they just won't work. <laughs> right? And I, you know, I went through the process. I left him on the table. And when he came out, he was actually smiling and happy and felt much more alive and, and much more hopeful about life. Um, and, and, I did, and that's one of the, the more extreme cases of having to use state control first. But by and large, the first thing I would do 
after I got, you know, when I got them to the table and I, and I would always tell them what the points did based, based on my understanding of acupuncture using hypnotic language. And then I would finally finish that up with a formal meditation or Qigong practice. We all know it as the element induction, of course, but, but, uh, you know, and they would get off that table feeling like a million bucks, you know, and, and that's kind of what I did through most of my, my acupuncture training. And I had a 1500 out, 11, between 1,100 and 1,500 hours, I think, of, of actual clinical training. That Which anyone out there could take that same formula. And, you know, my nickname of it is going placebo on techniques that actually work. That we're, we're putting the filters on top of a method that, you know, we're selling the whole way through. That here's the result this is going to have. This is why we're doing it on this specific day. And taking something that was already well-researched, but now framing it in such a way to get an even powerful, more powerful result. Uh, David, we're coming up on uh, time here. And I'll put in the links over in the show notes the class that's coming up in November, which actually we've made it simple, uh, David Snyder, D.C., Dot com that's going to be November 16th to 18th here in the uh, greater DC area. Uh, any final thoughts as we've been talking about uh, influence and conversational hypnosis and, and state management to leave the audience with? Well, I think if you learned nothing else but how to do the state control drills that you're going to learn in December, you're going to see an ex, an, um, and this is honest, don't, you don't have to believe what I say when I say this, but test it. You're going to see an exponential increase in the compliance that you get from people. You're going to see a huge bump in, in treatment outcomes because you'll understand that the most important thing in any hypnosis interaction is what you do with your body and the feeling states in your body. Everything human beings do, conscious or unconscious, is in response to a feeling that they have. It's either a feeling they want more of or a feeling they want a whole lot less of. To take that even further, they're more affected by the feelings they're unaware of than the feelings they are. And that's what state control allows you to do is to give the person sensations and messages and feelings that they may or may not be conscious of, but still affect them and prime them to be more responsive and receptive to your messages. And so that's where we're going to start with our conversation of gnosis training. And then we're going to take you through all six phases of what we call the universal persuasion protocol. And then we're going to get really hardcore and show you some uh, some really cool conversational hypnosis. I hate to use this word. It sounds like almost unethical, but hacks that we can use to really take our, our conversational hypnosis skills uh, to a whole new level and, and make it more cross-contextual. To me, it's not enough, Jason, that this stuff, you can only use this stuff therapeutically. To me, hypnosis is a life skill. And if we're not utilizing all the skills we have to make every aspect of our life better, we're leaving a huge part of our power on the table. So if people want to make, get more of what they want and less of what they don't, I invite you to come on out and join me and Jason in November for our Conversational Hypnosis Masterclass. Jason Lynette here once again, and as always, thank you so much for leaving your feedback online, for sharing this on your social media streams, writing reviews everywhere you possibly can, and once again, sharing the stage this week, head over to davidsnyderdc.com. Now, make sure you head over there right away, because there's some really cool, rather generous early admission promos that are available for those that sign up for this event. Uh, we're actually already nearing a bit of capacity on this event, as already so many people were interested, traveling in already from all over over the country for this specific event. If you haven't spent time yet with David, you're going to see exactly why he draws the crowd that he does. And if you've already spent time with him, uh, you'll see that there's already a few folks who have done this class exactly, and they're coming back for even more. So power up your persuasion and really master your own influence with conversational hypnosis in this masterclass. Check it out, davidsnyderdc.com. See you soon. Thanks for listening to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast at WorkSmartHypnosis.com. Hey there, it's Jason, and I want you to be one of the first to find out as we upload amazing new content. So do this right now. Click the subscribe button right here on this video. That's going to link you to our YouTube channel here, and you will be the first to find out as new resources and downloads are made available. Do it now.